you have your Bible, turn with me to Matthew, the 12th chapter, if you would. Let's all stand as we honor God's word by standing. Matthew, the 12th chapter. I'm only going to read to you one verse out of this 12th chapter. And... Um, <clears throat> Matthew 12, and I'm going to read verse 20. Verse 20 says, A bruised reed shall he not break. I want you, I want you to get these words now of this, of this one verse. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the day. Thank you for the blessings of it. Thank you for the time that we had this morning, the great memorial that we had when we served the Lord's Supper. And Lord, help us, each and every one of us, to remember that these are special times. And, and Lord, we're just thankful for this afternoon and every service at Landmark Baptist Church is a special service. And Lord, I just pray that you'll bless those that come and and, and, Lord, for some reason, uh, put it in the hearts of those that don't come to come. Now, Lord, go with us and take care of us. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. <clears throat> I've titled this message today, Comfort for the Feeble. Now, um, talk about comfort for the feeble. This is a, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to tell you exactly what this verse is talking about right now. But before I get finished, you, you're going to know what this verse is referring to. Now, um, you know, there is a, a vast void between feebleness and fame. You know, when we, when we talk about feebleness, we're... We're not necessarily talking about old age, which it can refer to old age, uh, but we're not necessarily talking about uh, um, somebody that's got some kind of, uh, uh, born with some kind of an impediment or something. Um, we're not talking about that type of feebleness. But uh, the type of feebleness we're referring to here now is, is feebleness when we come before the Lord. You know, a lot of times uh, we, we don't go before the Lord until we are feeble is what it amounts to is, you know, we'll live our lives here on earth and then when we get old and then we, we think it's necessary every day to pray that God will take care of us and as the approaching uh, time comes for us exiting this world, then we have a tendency to want to go before God in a feeble sense and want to ask that God would take care of us and watch over us while, while, while we were young and able to do for ourselves. And we very seldom went to the Lord and, and prayed for help. And, and so that's, uh, th this, this is talking about comfort for the feeble. And we're going to talk about two different feeble folks here uh, in, before we get finished this afternoon. So there, there's a big void between feebleness and fame. There is a lot spoken concerning the famous. Uh, when we talk about uh, the famous, then this is what makes them famous, for there is a, a lot spoken concerning them. You know, if, if, if your name was in the news every day, you'd become famous. If your picture, if your picture was in the paper every day, you'd eventually become famous. And if people talked about you, if people stood around in groups and talked about you, you would eventually become famous. Now, I'm not talking about uh, uh, talk against somebody. I'm talking about when you call uh, talking and building, building somebody up. You know, uh, just like. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Friday night when, when Lynn Moore said uh, little Garrett Gillis uh, intercepted that ball. You know, for just for a moment there, he was famous. You know, for just one moment there, but his teammates couldn't do anything about it. 
even after he did it. But, uh, but at any rate, uh, you know, it was um, a moment there. You know, fame is something when, when people want to talk about you. You know, when people want to talk about your achievements in life and, and such as that. Fame is, is, fame is not an impartial judge, for she has her favorites. Now, fame will cause a man or woman to exalt some and, and cause some to be defamed because of their status. You know, I don't want anything to do with that person. I don't want anything to do with that person. I don't want anything to do with that person. You know that, and I'm not talking about because they're poor, and I'm not talking about because they are, uh, like I said, that they are in some ways, they're old. What they're talking about is, you know, did you know that people look at, 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 to, at Christians as being feeble? Because they don't get out there in the world, they don't, just like Jesus, the Bible says Jesus made himself of, 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 of no, um, uh, made himself of, of, of not, not famous, put it that way. Je Jesus didn't do that. Jesus lived a life as such, a lowly life, as such that he did not make himself famous in that sense of the word. All the talk about Jesus was not because he was, he healed the sick and, and because, he, he, because he, fed the, he fed the hungry. But all the talk about Jesus was a fact was he's different. He's not like the rest of us. He, 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 doesn't, he doesn't speak like the rest of us. He doesn't talk like the rest of us. But Jesus didn't go around to make himself famous. But Jesus humbled himself and he, and he became a servant. And, and he, sir, he came, became a servant to, to his people. So we, we know that. Fame was waiting on the likes of Alexander the Great, who once thought that he ruled the whole world, but when he sat down and realized that he had conquered the whole world, now this is true, when he realized he'd conquered the whole world, this caused him to sit down and cry for there was no more world to conquer. You know, fame, fame will soon fizzle out. Whatever, whatever you're doing, you know, whatever you're doing, it will soon fizzle out. Now, listen to all this. You may say, well, what kind of, what is this? Well, it's going, there'll be some sense in it just a little while. Um, the fame was waiting on the likes of Luther, who withstood, withstood the whole Catholic Church against salvation by works. How, how do I know that? Luther's famous today. Preachers preach about Luther. People preach about him because he nailed the 95 Thesis to the castle door at Wittenberg. And as a result of that, you know, people preach about him today. So that's, that's what made Luther famous. Luther is famous for that particular thing right there. So that's what made him famous. But, the, but, but there are those who have given their lives to follow the Lord whose fame has been entirely forgotten. You know, that, uh, they've been entirely forgotten. Fame has left behind all those who gave the very lives to stand for the truth against all of Rome and the Protestants during the Great Inquisition. All those people, some believe as many as 50 million people died during that time. 50 million Christians. 50 million Christians, some say, died during that time. And, but, uh, anybody know any one of them? Is any one of them written down in a book anywhere? You know, you take um, uh, just, just how famous was it to lose your head as a great apostle Paul did. How famous is that? To lose your head, well, there was one, over 1.2 million of those Christians in that day during, during the Great Inquisition, 2.5 million of those Christians lost their heads. 
there was a head on a stake every 10 feet between Edinburgh, England, and, 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 and the Welch border. There, there was a head, there was a head on, on a stake of a Christian. And, and, and they, they fawned it. They, they, they fawned it. Well, you go down that line of those heads on there, how many knows who they were? How many, how many knows who they were? No one. That's, that's what we're talking about. There, there's a big difference between feebleness and fame. Because we don't, we, none of us know who those people are. And matter of fact, I even heard said one time that we didn't need, need, even need to think about them. Now, you're talking about feebleness. We didn't even need to think about them. What about, what about all those that were locked in the church buildings? And, and, and all those that, that wouldn't, uh, that, that did, that wouldn't uh, deny Christ... All those that did deny Christ got up and went out, but all those who wouldn't do it, they concreted up the building and let them smother to death. What about all those? Who were they? What was their names? They certainly weren't famous people. But let me tell you one thing. The state church, which at that time was a Roman church, the state church... And, and, uh, and the well-known Protestants such as Luther and, 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 uh, and, and um, all those that uh, have, uh, started the Protestant churches, all those, oh, they're, they're, uh, uh, they're famous today. Well, there's even, there's even a church today named after a Cal John Calvin. There's a church named after Luther. Their, their, their church is named after Wesley. And, but what about those people that were killed during that Inquisition? Some 50 million of them. Who knows who they are? That's what we're talking about. And if you're here today and you're saved and you want to serve the Lord, you'll never be famous. You will never be famous. And I tell you, once you leave this world, you'll be forgotten. You know, Rhonda said to me many times, she said, well, when, when you do go, there'll be a lot of people remember you. No, they won't. I told Rhonda, I said, just as soon as I have to give it up at Landmark Baptist Church and they get a new pastor, I said, most people will forget who I am. And, and, and 20 years from now, you could ask them, well, who was your pastor in, uh, in, in uh, 2017? Most of uh, so some of you won't be here, but, but, uh, but what I'm saying is those of you that are here, you young people, you won't be able to name it. You won't be able to name it. Don't you forgotten about it. See, that's, what, that's the difference in being famous and being feeble. Because you're, 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 I've, I've heard Brother Sam pray uh, years ago heard Brother Sam pray, and he said, talking about a, a, thank, a thankless job. He was talking about a pastor, and he said, it's a thankless job. And, and but that's what it is. That, that's the difference in feebleness. You know, there, as we said, and lastly, not lastly as far as the message is concerned, but lastly on these thoughts of the introduction, what about Jesus himself? Only those who know him as their Savior speak often about him. The world doesn't speak about Jesus. The world doesn't speak about Jesus, but sad to say, even some of those who profess to be saved don't ever talk about him. Jesus, in a sense, was feeble. He was feeble in a sense. And this has to do with what I've just said, all, these, all this I've just said for the last 10 or 15 minutes, about the last 15 minutes. All this I just said goes right back to a bruised reed, shall he not break? And smoking flax, shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory? 
All of you know the verse of Scripture. Romans 8, 28 says, uh, concerning, concerning all things work together for good to them, to them who are the called according, to them, them who love, Je love the Lord, and to them who are called according to his purpose. You ever think about that? Well, look at that. Till he send forth judgment unto victory. Let me tell you, folks, you, you, your life's not going to be changed. I'm talking about you as a child of God. Your life's not going to be changed until you stand before the judgment and then he judges you and you realize then it was victory. All the time we lived on this earth, all the time we served on this earth, we're not victims. We're not victims. None of us are victims. That's the thing that saddens me so much. So many people want to be a victim. They don't want to look. They don't want to look and realize that, that when the Lord judges us, we're going to be made victors. When, when he judges us. Now, how much do we really know? Well, how much do we know about his followers? How much do we really know about them? I, I, I've already said those that died during the Inquisition, we don't know anything about them. We don't even know who they were. We just know that they had, they, a lot of them, a lot of the, those congregations went by many different names. Paulicians, uh, 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 Waldenses, Albertenses, and all they, they, they went by, by ever, who, ever who their leader was, they, they went by his name. But his, their leader got killed too, along with them. But they went by his name. But um, what about his followers? I do believe that every child who comes to him comes as a bruised reed. Now listen, I'm going to bring out what he's talking about here. We teach you something here. If one is to come to Christ... He first must have been beaten down by the Holy Spirit's conviction concerning his sin. That's what he's talking about here. The bruised reeds he's talking about here are the ones that go to Christ for salvation. That's what he's referring to here. The ones that go to Christ for salvation. They've been beaten down. That's called, uh, uh, that's called lapsarianism. I, I said mentioned that the other, I believe, last Sunday, too. That's called lapsarianism. When the, Lord, when the Lord gets you down as low as you can go, then he's ready to lift you up. When that bruised reed, when that bruised reed comes, to, comes to Christ, what does he say about it? He says, a bruised reed shall not break. In other words, the Lord said, they're going to come, but they're not going to break. They're going to think they're defeated, but they're not. They're going to realize that they're not defeated. They're, they're not defeated. One must come as one with a broken spirit and a contrite heart. He says the only way, only way you can go to Christ is, is by having a, a broken heart, I mean a, a broken spirit and a contrite heart. We know it is said of Jesus in our text. A bruised reed shall he not break. Jesus will not break one down any lower than the Holy Spirit has already, but he'll lift him up. Listen, he'll not, he'll, he, they're defeated. When you go to Christ for salvation, you're defeated. You don't, you don't have no other, nowhere else to turn. That's exactly what J uh, Peter said. When Jesus looked at the disciples, he said, will you also go away? And Peter said, where are we going to go? We don't know where else to go to. When, when, when you came to Christ for salvation, you were defeated. That's the bruised reed. You were defeated. But Christ is not going to step on you and beat on you and stomp on you. But he's going to lift you up. And praise God, it's going to be unto victory. What greater victory can you have when you sit here and you serve on, in this, on this earth? What greater victory can you have... Than to, than to go to heaven and live with the Lord for all eternity in all the glory that God has. What, what, what better victory could you have 
You don't have victory now. You'll say, well, I won. Well, I won, you know, we, Georgia, Georgia won yesterday. Kentucky won yesterday. But they're going to be somebody going to beat them down next week. They got victory this week, but they got to go and get beat down again. Not saying that they'll lose, but they're going to go and get beat down again. Each week they got to go, you know. What is victory? Victory is something that lasts for all eternity. Victory is something that never ends. Victory is something, that's the reason I, it, it upsets me when, when you hear people are endless victims. You know, I didn't do this. I didn't do that. Uh, they're just people just lying on me. People's not telling the truth. People's not listening to, the, to me. They're listening to other people. That's a victim. That's not, that's not a victor. Now, the smoking flags. What's he referring to there? The smoking flags is a picture of a saved person who is backslidden and comes to Christ for confession and repentance. Now, let me tell you something, folks. When you've sinned against the Lord as a saved person, when you presumptuously sin, then when you go to him, you're going to go to him as a smoking flax because that's exactly what the Holy Spirit's going to do to you. Holy Spirit's going to convict you with a fire that you've never seen before. You see, that's why I often wonder why people can sit and sit and sit years after years after years and never ever show any confession and any repentance of their sins. That bothers me. Bothers me to no end. It really does. It is a terrible, it is a terrible fire. Now let me get back up here. What are we who are already saved when we must go to Jesus to find comfort because we have lost all comfort because of sin by the smoking flax. Sin is the smoking flax that brings us down. Brings us down. It's a terrible fire said, that is said in man or woman who is being convicted of sin and they have which they have willingly committed. It's a terrible fire. It's a terrible fire inside your belly. It's a terrible fire. There's a fire inside your belly when you want to serve the Lord, but there's also a fire inside your belly when you're beaten down by sin too. And when you go to Christ and you ask forgiveness for your sins, you know, we, we just had a, a great service where people were praying and, and where people were asking the Lord to forgive them and people uh, examining themselves. We just had a great service, but now I'm telling you now, you know, that that goes right on. That goes right on. You know, sometimes we have to, we have to openly confess those sins. As a matter of fact, we're going to pray for the sick among us in just a little while. And one of the things he says there with the sick among us, turn with me to, to the book of um, James, all, all the way over to the book of James. And look, and look what James says. James says in the 16th verse, confess your faults one to the other. That does away with this. I heard somebody say one time in Sunday school, all you got to do is just silently pray. You don't, have to, you don't have to openly confess your sins. You do too. You do too. That, 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 that secret praying who knows who secret prays? Just by somebody says they do. But let me tell you, folks, confess your faults one to another. And, and we, we talked this morning about, about some of the, un, what, what happens when you take the Lord's Supper unworthily. But here's what he says. Confess your faults one to another. Pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You're not a righteous person till you confess your faults. You're not a righteous person if you're sitting there with sin in your life that's unconfessed and unforgiven. That's not a righteous person. 
But he says, once you're a righteous person, when you confess your faults one to another and you're a righteous person, then the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The smoking flax, it's a terrible fire. Weakness is conviction. I'm sorry, weakness in conviction is evident when a lost soul comes seeking salvation. However, it is also evident in a child of God who's being convicted of being convicted because of his or her sin against the holiness of an almighty God. You know, it was David, it was David who cried out. David didn't go silently somewhere pray and then come back and tell everybody he did. No, David cried out, Lord, thee and only thee have I sinned against. Lord, I, Lord, I, I've sinned against you. You know, I've done a lot of things against my neighbor, but for this one time, it's you that I sinned against. You and you only that I sinned against. We don't see much of that in these days, which makes one wonder if, if there are those who are truly saved, how the Lord deals with them. We're going to talk about this judgment in just a moment. The second thing we want to see here is how much do we know about his judgment unto victory? Judgment unto victory. Judgment unto victory. The Lord's got to judge you before you move to victory. And the Lord's not going to judge you unless you're willing to confess your faults, unless you're willing to confess your sins and repent of them. Your judgment's not going to be very good. It's not going to be unto victory. It's going to be unto the fires of hell. That's what it's going to be. Just, just this is a wonderful sound. There is a wonderful sound of victory. Wonderful sound of, of victory. A victory. You know, uh, I, know it do, I know it does not comfort a dying man to pump up his, his success in life. It only helps to comfort the survivors. You know, that's, that's all you're doing. All you're doing is comforting the survivors. What's the funeral for? To comfort the survivors. You know, you can't do nothing for that man, that's, that body, that soul that's already left that body that's in a casket. You can't do anything for them. All you can do is comfort the survivors, and, and that's what makes the survivors happy. As long as somebody comforts them, as long as the survivors are, comfort, are comforted. <clears throat> Coming events. I'm sorry, when you consider old age, you must consider that a lot of age people are bruised reeds. A lot of age Christians are bruised reeds. And a lot of them are, uh, have, have gone through a lot of smoking flax too. Coming events in their lives cast the shadow of death. You know, that's what comes. What's next in your life when you get old? That's what the, that's what the fella told uh, um, R.G. Lee when he, he spoke at a commencement exercise and in, 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 a, in a local university. And some young Japanese student came to him after service and, and said, Mr. Lee said, uh, I want to talk to you some more. And Mr. Lee said, about what? R.G. Lee said, about what? He said, I want to talk to you about what you said today. And R.G. Lee told him, said, I'll let you talk to me. Can I talk to you? The student said, sure you can. He said, why are you here at this university? He said, why were you here tonight? He said, I was here tonight because I graduated from this, this school. He said, what then? What, what, what's, what's now in your life? He said, well, I'm going to go out and get me a good career, make good money. He said, what then? He said, well, he said, I hope to find a good girl and, and I hope to marry her someday and have money to support her and all that. And, and R.G. Lee said, that's good. He said, that's fine. He said, that's good thinking. But he said, what then? He said, well, I, when I someday I hope to retire, and have a good retirement to where me and my wife can live pretty happily the rest of our lives. And he said, that's good. That's a good thing to think about. But he said, what then? 
They said the young man just bowed his head. This is a true story. So the young man just bowed his head and he kind of looked up at Brother R.G. Lee and he said, uh, well, I guess I'll just die. And R.G. Lee said, what then? He said, what do you mean, what then? He said, you're just going to go to hell? That's what happens after death. If you're not saved, you're going to go to hell. So let, let me tell you, folks, this life soon gets down to old age. And the shadow of death begins to cloud old age. You know, I think Carmen said this this morning about, uh, said, said something about, I don't know what she was talking, I don't remember what she was talking about now, but talking about being, oh, about being cold when she come in, said, said, I just don't, something about a, somebody in their 40s, I don't know why they feel like this. In other words, uh, 20 years ago, you weren't in your 40s. 20 years after that, Carmen, you've got one alternative in life. And that is you're going to have to wait on death. I'm not saying you have to just quit, but you have to wait on death because that's the next big event in your life. When you get that age, next big event. The Lord promised, now listen to this, let me, let me read the promise here and I'm about finished. The Lord promised the bruised reed I will not break. And look what he says here. And smoking flax shall he not quench till he send forth judgment unto victory. You're not going to get victory until you leave this world. You're not going to see victory until you leave this world. Oh, you may win a battle or two here, a battle here and there, and you'd be happy with that. But I want to tell you, you're not going to see real victory. If you're a saved person, you're not going to see real victory until you leave this world. You know, that's what these, uh, uh, these Muslims, you know, that's what they tell them. You know, they tell them, they say, if you go out and kill a bunch of Christians and a bunch of infidels and, said, if, and, and you give your life for that, then you're going to have 70 virgins waiting on you. I got to tell you, they're not out there. They're not out there. I must look back, I, speaking of myself, I must look back at weakness, but I must always look forward to victory because it's coming. It's promised. He said, he said, smoking flax shall not be quenched till he send forth judgment unto, the, unto victory. As long as you live here, you're going to have sin in your life. You're going, to, you're going to have that smoking flax of sin in your life. And you're going to have to constantly be repenting. You have to constantly be asking the Lord to forgive you. You have to constantly be coming to the Lord and, and asking this. You, you have to constantly be doing this. You know, I've often said this many times. If you haven't confessed and repented of your sins, don't ask for, don't ask for prayer. Don't ask for prayer because it's not going to work. I can tell you right now, if Gary and, 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 and Greg, if they haven't repented of their sins and they haven't received forgiveness of those sins, and it's useless for us to get up here and put our hands on and pray for them because it's not going to work. That smoking flax is always going to be there. You know, we, might, we had a great service this morning, but how many will go out this afternoon and Commit sin. Even after a great service this morning. That's because of that smoking flax. Now let me ask you this question. Where do you turn to find comfort in the time of need? Where do you turn? Just think about that. All right, let's all stand if you would. And let's be dismissed in prayer and then we'll form a circle. And